Hello. Good morning. Welcome to Catalyst. I like hearing all the conversation. I hate interrupting. You are at our monthly gathering of area leaders and influencers, and we come together every month um, to collaborate, to learn from each other, and to build trusting relationships. Um, so I'm excited you're here. Glad you're all here. Uh, we've got some good stuff for you today. Uh, really quickly, so if you are, first, we ask you every month, so it's hopefully not new, but if you can pull out your phones and do and check in on Facebook. Um, it just kind of lets people know that we're this is happening and that it's good stuff, um, and hopefully can encourage them to be like, hey, what do you do every, you know, where, where do you go every month and, and come on in? So if you need help doing that, if you don't know how, let me know, I'll help you. Um, but uh, go ahead and pull that out. That's the only time we're gonna tell you to pull out your phone. So pull it out, check in on Facebook. Um, if you are a first time guest, we have cards on the tables. Um, for you to give us your information, just so we can keep you up to date on events and um, kind of know who's here in the room. So if you can fill that out if you're a first-time guest. If you're returning, if you can make sure you sign in on the sign-in sheets that are on your table, that'd be great. Thanks. And let's see. So if you guys could go ahead and stand up, what we're going to do is have you connect with someone that you don't know. So hopefully go to a new table, le learn somebody's name, um, and introduce yourself. And I want you to state a time or share a time you were given an opportunity to lead early in your leadership. So find somebody new and talk through a time that you were given an opportunity to lead early in your relationship or in Good morning. I'm going to introduce the speaker here shortly. If we can find our way back to our seats, that would be awesome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This is an exciting day for me. Um, the Global Leadership Summit and we'll meet Dave Bushnell here in a little bit. But personally, I was invited to go to the Global Leadership Summit five years ago in Chicago. And in industry, I've traveled to numerous conferences, I'm privileged to hear some of the best speakers in the world, and I go, I'm thinking, okay, it's a church conference, how's this gonna be? It's the best conference I've ever been to in my life. I pay to go to Chicago every year, they send team members there, and now we're gonna have the honor of having this right here in Modesto. So we're talking world-class leaders, and what I loved is we saw a church doing this with excellence. You're talking over 13,000 people on campus. People are fed on time. You're a live studio audience for hundreds of thousands of people watching all around the country. Everything runs on time. Speakers, I've heard Colin Powell, Melinda Gates, Jim Collins, and it is a amazing, incredible, impactful conference, but it's not one that I've gone, and I, I call it the conference high. And I'll say, oh, I came back and I was on that conference high, and then this is all going to fizzle out. The material afterwards and what we've shared and done internally with our teams and the people I've shared the content from this conference has had actual meaningful impact with measurable results from this conference. So I'm a strong believer in it. And I want to introduce Dave here. So a little background on Dave. Uh, he's a regional director for Willow Creek. And Dave catalyzes local communities across 13 Western states to leverage the Global Leadership Summit to help individuals, teams, and organizations maximize their impact. And I can say that's absolutely true. Um, prior to serving with Willow Creek, Dave was a local church pastor for 18 years. He also coaches local churches toward health and growth as part of the CDF Leadership Capital Group. Dave and Karen have been married for over 20 years and have five children who provide their greatest leadership challenges. And with that, I'd love to introduce Dave Bushnell. Bushnell. Thanks. Thank you. I got one. Thank you. Boy, it's a delight to be with you today. And uh, you just had a chance to share a little bit about that moment when you were invited to early in your leadership tenure, right, into a, into a leadership spot. And I want to share my answer to that. It was as a sixth grader, I'm just walking home from school and this large step van 
rolls by and you're kind of, you know, you know the, the, the stranger danger alarms are going off, right? And so this, uh, this guy steps out of the step van and he says, hey, do you want a job? I, oh, I don't know. Would, uh, I've been sixth grade. Do I want a job? Do I not? And so he then proceeded me to talk about what I might do for his company. I ended up being a paper boy for the next three years, delivering newspaper, working 365 days a year, right? Going and door knocking and collecting the, the money for the company and the whole deal. That was my first foray into leadership, just kind of being a little business uh, owner, if you will, of a little section of my neighborhood for the newspaper. And boy, I can't believe that they entrusted that to an 11-year-old kid, right, in, in sixth grade. It was, it was just crazy to think about. So you fast forward the movie, and now I, I have the honor of serving with the Willow Creek Association, who produces the Global Leadership Summit held all over the world. And the Willow Creek Association, over the last 20 years, has been able to learn a good bit about leadership development all over the world as the summit has gone, uh, gone global. The summit exists in uh, 1,375 different locations in 128 countries. It's translated into 60 languages. And so we get a good look over the last few decades at leadership in different cultures. And what we've learned is that from continent to continent, there's uh, a, it, leadership development and leadership culture very significantly. And at the end of the day, you can look and make the conclusion that leadership reflects culture. So whatever a culture a country might have, a region might have, a community might have, it's very likely that their leadership reflects that culture. So for example, in Asia, what we see is that there is an intense value placed on age. And so the older you are, that's what actually qualifies you to be a leader. So younger leaders, uh, people that are, that are young, are actually, they don't have entree into leadership quite as easily as folks that are, that are older, because that's, that's the value. So some of you just became leaders. So congratulations, you know, with your, with your age. So we'll look to you at, at, as, as our stalwarts. So there, there may be uh, then other, other cultures in the world. So you look at Africa, for example. Africa continues to be tribal in, in a significant part of the continent. And so what we're seeing is that that is the foundation of leadership in those areas. So the folks that are, are the leaders of the tribe, everyone else interacts with them from a subservient kind of a mentality. In Latin America in a and in Africa, there's rampant corruption. That has infected and looked after, you know, kind of influencing the leadership development that is happening in those regions. People uh, rise to power through corrupt means. That wealth is, is a significant determining factor in leadership and in preserving a leadership uh, position. They do so kind of out of this, out of this corruption type of a, of, of a scenario. So there are lots of different cultures around the world. Every one of them affects the leadership development temperature and what leaders look like. Now, what we're also finding is that as a, as a result of our world becoming smaller, in order to remain competitive, in order to have a competitive edge in the global marketplace, cultures around the world are starting to realize we actually need to send people with specific skill sets into the global marketplace if we're going to maintain a competitive edge. And so there's an increasing amount of attention that is being paid all around the world to raising up leaders, to instilling a specific skill set into individuals so that they can maintain a competitive edge in, uh, in, in the global economy. So what we're finding is that that takes an enormous amount of intentionality. Because when you think about it, going upstream in a culture is very, very challenging. Maybe you've experienced that with a, a workplace culture at some point or uh, where you have this picture of what's, what could be, but it's so challenging to get there. So there's an enormous amount of intentionality that some leaders are going about uh, bringing an, in a new day 
in terms of leadership development. We see it in, in uh, the corporate sector where there are global companies who are starting to identify kind of that, that fast track for young professionals with high, high uh, leadership potential. And so they'll introduce them and uh, to entrust them with, with leadership very early in their tenure, uh, throw some skill sets at them and development very quickly so that they can rise uh, in an intentional way. One of the leaders who is, is best at this um, from, that we have, have come in contact with happens to be in the church world. And so this leader is looking to say, okay, how do I raise up leaders within the church? Now, if your world is outside of the church world, we believe that armed with enough humility, a leader can learn from anyone. And so, you know, we see that the church is learning from the marketplace, and we can see marketplace also learning from the church. So I'd like to share with you just a little video clip of a, of a man named Oscar Marayu, who is an African leader swimming upstream in the African culture to develop leaders within his setting. So look for transferable principles if, if, if a church world is not your setting, look for transferable principles as he is teaching that may apply to your leadership settings. So this is Oscar Marayu. The harvest is plentiful, the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples, but the workers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers or harvesters into the harvest field. As I read this verse, it slowly dawned on me that the size of your harvest depends on how many leaders you have. You see, the Lord was saying that the problem is not the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. The problem is not the harvest. The harvest is ripe. The problem is the harvesters. There are not enough harvesters, not enough leaders to get the work done. No problem with the harvest. Even for those of us who come from countries where it is difficult to preach the gospel and to see people come to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus would still say to us, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The more harvesters we commission, to the harvest field, the greater the harvest will be. The fewer the harvesters, the smaller your harvest will be. You know, it dawned on me that Jesus' own strategy in harvesting was not to throw himself into the harvest field and to start reaping as fast as he could. Jesus' own strategy was to first find his leaders, the 12 disciples, and to invest himself into their lives, to call them to walk with him. And he didn't throw himself into the work first. He found his leaders. We so often do it the other way around. We're busy running around. We're too busy to train anyone. And we're tired and we're worn out. Our families are feeling ignored. It's hurting us. We're almost on the verge of burnout. But we can't stop because the numbers are growing. Jesus did it the other way around. He first found his leaders and grew them. And today you and I are the result of his strategy. If you don't have leaders around you, then the reach of your leadership will be limited to your personal capacity. Let me suggest that one of the signs of great leadership is not the impact you have during your lifetime. One of the signs of great leadership is how many leaders you raised up who will continue the work after you have left. As a leader, you're probably busy, living on the verge of burnout, tired with more on your plate than you can handle. But exactly how many leaders surround you? How many of these young Leaders, are you growing? Because the impact of your life 
will depend not on how hard you worked, but on how many leaders you raised up. The more harvesters you have, then the more harvest you will be able to bring in. So did you catch, did you catch that from whatever it is that you're leading, your capacity cap is the leadership, the number of leadership, the, the bandwidth of leaders within what it is that you are leading. That's a capacity cap. So you think about Oscar, who lives in Africa. His, he's extremely intentional with the way that he goes about reproducing leaders within his organization. And it has to be that intentional because the culture is going against what he is doing. And so he takes very, very specific calculated decisions speak to, to call out, raise up, pour into, develop, put skill set impartation in, upon folks that are not yet ready. He's intentional about that to expand the leadership capacity of his organization and handle the workload. Got to go against the culture for that. So as I've been thinking about, okay, well, what's the culture in the United States? If we've got, you know, we can learn about cultures around the world. Leadership reflects that. What about our culture? And I've got to, you know, as I think about our culture and I think about what we kind of wear as a medal of honor, it's busyness, right? And we just come up to it and say, hey, are you staying busy? Are you busy? Late? Oh, how you been? I've been busy. We, we raise that up. We value that. And I think it probably impacts our leadership development. And it, 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 where our, so you think for a moment even about the first step with leadership development. First step with leadership development is choosing who it is that you are going to invest in and raise up. As leaders, we are busy. We've got a ton of things that we need to do. Our selection of who we're going to raise up to help us do those things is often based on who's ready to do those things. Well, those are folks that are already reaching uh, more maturity. It's probably not going to take a whole lot of development to have those folks. And so we just look for the folks that are ready to go. We grab some stuff on, off of our plate and we dump it on their plate. Why? Because we're busy. Where's the development in that? Mark Miller captures this really, really well, and I just want to share a little 90-second video clip. Mark Miller is the uh, Vice President for Training and Development for Chick-fil-A, 1,700 stores around the United States. Let's see what he has to say about this selection of, of people who are, are potentially leaders. Do your emerging leaders have ample opportunities to lead? Now, I bet if I surveyed you, if I could sit down with each of you individually and said, tell me about how you learned the most about leadership. You're going to say, well, it was from leading something. I mean, that's, the data is clear on that, universal, around the planet. Leaders learn most of what they know about leading from leading. And that's been your experience, and that's been my experience. So why is this so challenging? I, I don't have a complete answer. I, I think it has something to do with the fact we really don't like risk, even the most bold and courageous, that risk kind of raises some yellow flags. So when we have an issue, we want to solve the issue. We want to step into the gap. We want to infuse leadership, but we also want to temper and mitigate risk if we can. And so I think there's something going on in our heads that, that often leads us to tap existing mature leaders for the next challenge, the next opportunity, or the next problem. I, I think it's almost a reflexive um, thought process. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but I'd ask you to pay attention. I have. I've been in meetings. You identify a problem or an opportunity, and somebody says, well, who could tackle this? And you go and you start writing down names. You get five or six or seven names up there and stop and look at that list and say, how many of those are emerging leaders? It's usually very, very few. Sometimes those lists will not have a single emerging leader on them. So you might try a different approach. Think about some of the skills, some of the opportunities, some of the challenges, and some of the problems you want emerging leaders to experience. 
Maybe it's a startup. Maybe it's a turnaround. Maybe it's to take a high-performing team to another level and identify those. And as you come across other men and women on your team that need an infusion of leadership, you know exactly what they need and you start playing a matchmaker role. And over time, you can actually grow your leaders at an exponential rate. Now, this is not a dump and run. This isn't just throw them in the, in the pool, right? It is give them opportunities, real opportunities for real leadership, but then help them learn and grow through the process. Do your emerging leaders have ample opportunities to lead? So he captures... This ref- I love what, he, love what he says, reflexive tendency to look for people who are already developed, but instead to look for people who are not yet ready and invest in them, give them opportunity. An 11-year-old kid walking home from school, let me entrust a customer base to that individual. The amount that I was able to learn as a middle school kid delivering newspapers was huge, still drawing from those lessons today. So who is it that you know who is not yet ready that you might impart to, that you might invest in, that you might develop? I think about this room and I think these are the key influencers in Modesto. And I think what would happen if this room was doubled in size? because of the influence that you have in the life of another, because of the development, the intentionality that you have in raising up another leader, where would Modesto's capacity be then? Whatever it is that you are leading, it could have capacity increase if it had another leader. Now, here's the thing. You say, okay, Dave, great. How do I go about developing another leader? And we overcomplicate leadership development. We think that we've got to come up with some 48-week, three-ring binder curriculum and run people through it. And it's, you know, I'm going to have to sit down and construct that. Think way simpler than that. And just simply think about time spent with. Simply think about intentionally being near somebody grabbing some content that you might view or read and talk about it together. It doesn't have to be much more complex than that. So I gave this a try two years ago. I said, okay, I'm going to actually see if that works. And I I gathered six leaders from my community and I said, hey, do you guys want to go on a leadership learning journey together? And I made sure that some of those folks were emerging leaders, that they were 20 years my junior because I wanted them at the table to learn from them as well and have them learn from folks that had more leadership experience. So it's a glorified book club at the end of the day. Just say, hey, here, read half this book, then come together and let's talk about it for 60 minutes once a month. That's it. And it has revolutionized what each one of these individuals are leading. It doesn't have to be very complex. You're ready to go right now and do that. It just takes a little bit of time. That's the key ingredient, and that's why it's countercultural, because the most valuable thing in our culture is time, right? We're all busy, but this leadership development thing with a little bit of your time investing in someone else, Modesto's capacity will increase. We need more use in Modesto. We need them. Whose job is it to make them? It's your job. Go make another leader. Go raise somebody up, pour into somebody. And we invite you to to do that here. The Global Leadership Summit is coming to Modesto. Don't come alone. Bring somebody with you. Use it as a tool to bring that person that you're going to be developing with you. It's a conversation starter and seek to invest them. So we've invited you to to maybe consider a couple of questions uh, that'll that'll come on the screen here, I believe. And uh, as you start to ponder who it might be that you would develop, 
Who and how might you go about developing them? So just give you a little bit of time around the tables to uh, consider that, to talk about that. You're worth reproducing. And Modesto needs that. So think about who you might invest in and grow up as a leader. So thanks a bunch for this opportunity. So I'm standing in the back, and the thought comes to my mind, if you want people to bleed, you, a leader has to hemorrhage. And when it comes to Global Leadership Summit, and, and I'm going to get to them, I'm getting a little Latino here, a little passionate, all right? You ready? Most of the time I come up, and I'm pretty low-key, and I'm trying to nudge you because I'm trying to respect you, and in your own process of understanding, and you'll come along, you know, that, that's, that, yeah, that's usually my tone, you know, usually, except for this time. This for us, I'm telling you right now, this for us is not a stinking conference. Okay, now, I've been making pr public presentations in the clubs, and, the, and some of them kind of look at me like, oh, my gosh, do I have time? And I'll go, this is not, for me and for some of us who participate, is not a stinking another conference. All right, and I'm going to say stinking because you can use that word in church. <laughs> this is about being intentional. Those of us in the room, and this is not just about me, all of us in the room, being intentional to reshape the leadership culture in our community. This is our first big public effort to reshape the public leadership culture in our city. Whether it's developing young emerging leaders who continue to need opportunities to express their leadership skills. And the Lord knows we have not done a good job, as good as we should, strengthening female leaders in our community. We have, okay, this is just me, you can take it or leave it or whatever you want. We have dishonored women by not investing in them intentionally to lead like they've been gifted to lead. So, and this is about those of us with gray hair, or like Jeff over there, no hair, you know. I can say it to you, we're friends. So, here's an easy pray. For those of us who are older now, to begin to get intentional, to knock off this, oh, I'm old, and the millennials don't understand me, oh my God, forget it. You have the privilege and the opportunity with your skill to begin to be a not a sage on the stage, but a guide alongside. And to be intentional to find those young leaders who you can bond their heart with. So I want to say to you, and I say to my generation, knock this, oh my gosh, they don't understand me, junk. I sat in Starbucks about two weeks ago with a young man. I said, help me understand, and he's been doing research on millennials. Help me, give, give, talk to me, teach me. And it was an eye-opener, and I continued to search for those opportunities. So for me, I'm gonna, I want to hemorrhage, not just this morning, from, from, but from this point on. When it comes to this is an experience for us to bring all of us in the room from our community of different sectors to hear the same thing about lex excellence in leadership, to come up with some common language, to argue and disagree during the breaks. That's where the dialogue occurs and relationship building is going to happen. This is not just a stinking conference for our community. And, and, you, and you wouldn't know this, but I'm approached regularly. Hey, do this and do that. And, and we've, we've not done any of that till now. So this is about those of us in the room and those of us who can't be here this morning to begin to be intentional about leading the reshaping of our leadership culture in our community. And if you are not aware that there's some adjustments and some changes and some improvements that need to occur in our leadership culture in our community, I don't know, what you, I don't know where you've been. In every sector. Every, every one of us. This is about... Emerging leaders and being intentional to create opportunities for them, for emerging leaders. It's those of us with gray hair to be, how can I learn how to be a sage 
Not a sage on the stage, but a guide alongside. Strengthening the women around us because our culture in our city has not done that so well with them. Now, if you disagree with me, that's fine. I don't care. Been here long enough, I can say this. Like my mom, you know, my mom is 86. I was with her yesterday. Oh, my Lord, my mom can say whatever she wants to say. And I got, oh, my gosh, Mom. <laughs> not that I'm 86, but I'm just telling you. So I want to say this to you. This is not another stinking conference. And if you've been sitting here going, oh, my gosh, they're just beating us over the head with this. No. This is about reshaping and taking the lead to intentionally reshape the leadership culture in our city. And if anybody's going to do that, it's about the positive men and women who participate in Catalyst on a monthly basis and who are carrying this message of positive relationship building and trust building out in the workplace, out in the government, out in their neighborhoods on a regular basis. Too long. Too long negative voices have, resh have shaped the culture in our city and leadership. And I say to you, it is time, and this is one of our ways to make that happen. So, so everybody say with me, this is not about a stinking conference. <laughs> this is about, we don't need no other stinking conference. Uh, that's good, I got to use that next time. <laughs> and I was sitting in the back, thing. leaders have got to hemorrhage before followers can bleed. I want you to bleed leadership culture in our community, reshaping this. That means i got to start knocking off, some, in some ways, this little nudging thing that I do because I do respect you deeply. Um, Mark is going to come on up. We've got some just real specifics, and then Cindy will come up on the prayer breakfast. But um, Mark's got some just uh, directions. If you want to be a sponsor, this is, we, we'd love to have you there. Yay. But Dave just says, you know, don't come alone. Uh, I've been making public presentations on civic uh, clubs and those kind of things. So Mark... Garcia. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to take a moment to expand a little bit on a summit partnership opportunity. If you uh, have a, a church or organization that would like to partner with us and be a summit partner, it would allow for you to have some reduced rates as well for your group. So if you can have a promise to uh, at least bring about, I think it's 20 um, people and then you in a commitment that you would encourage a few other organizations to attend as well you can have a reduced rate there and there's some information on the back of the flyer if you'd like to contact me via email you can email me for more details on that partnership as well um, we have also sponsorship opportunities if you're interested in that as well you could also email myself which my email is in the back of the flyer mark at cityministrynetwork.org we have a few we have like four um, sponsorship packages that you can partner with us to help grow the leadership development in our community. So if you're interested in that, if you're a business and you'd like to um, do that, there's some package information that we can get over to you on what that looks like. Thank you, guys. Good job, Mark. Come on up, Cindy. One of the things that uh, the City Mission Network has been working on is why we want to host uh, Mission Greater Modesto and the Prairie Modesto organization is ho hosting and bringing along a prayer breakfast song. Yes. So two things. Today is National Day of Prayer, if you weren't aware. I came from the Educators Prayer Breakfast. We're going to also celebrate at noon in the city plaza. So if you have a chance to come to that, police, fire, military, some government officials will be there praying for the different sectors in our city. And then, next, and then our prayer breakfast is going to be June 15th at 7 o'clock at Big Valley. And you have to purchase tickets. They're only $10. We were still able to keep it at a low cost this year because of sponsors. And you can sponsor a table as well, which will help us out with that. And Cheryl. Cheryl Van Horn, raise your hand. Cheryl, she has tickets and are... Well, we, we went ticketless, but at least she can reserve your seats there. So that's what we're doing for that. So we hope to see you on June 15th at 7 o'clock a.m. at Big Valley. Yay. Thank you, Mrs. Marks. Thank you so much. Now, because we're, this is a diverse community, we've got some different uh, reflections of how Catalyst plays out. So I want to invite you for the female, for the women in the group, Sandy Gunnerson. They meet once a month at Inspire, and it's a women's group that comes once comes together once in the morning, once at noon on a Thursday, for mutual support and encouragement as well to inspire each other. Another way, if you are a social worker, welfare worker, if you're out in that public service portion of our community, we have a once a month 
smaller group as well um, called Catalyst Recovery for those who are involved in recovery ministries, social workers, those kind of things. And we continue to become diverse in how we reflect this excellence in culture and ability to put each of us in rooms together to develop trust and relationship. Because in our city, everything is trust and relationship. We are a nonprofit group. Uh, City Mission Network, if you want to invest in us financially, we'd love to have you do that. Uh, you can just go to our website or talk to me or Mark and figure out how you want to do that. Uh, but uh, we'd love to have you. Many of you have already participated, but I'd uh, love to, to engage you in that if this is something you really care about. When I said it, this is not a stinking, <laughs> not a stinking conference, I spoke, if I'm a salesman, I would have said, this is about reshaping a leadership culture in our city and in our businesses and what it looks like to be a leader in our community for the future, because I want to say to you, those of us in this room, the world behind us is not the same as the world in front of us. And together, we have to chart a course and a methodology because so many of us are used to leading back here, but it's not what's in front of us. And together, we have to figure that out as a whole community. Let me pray for you. Master, thank you for the time together. Uh, you grant us wisdom. And Lord, this is a great group of men and women who just love our city and to love the men and women around them in the midst of their um, difficult situations or wonderful places to work. Lord, may we begin to shape, be intentional to be agents of reshaping the leadership culture in our city in whatever place you've put them in. Whether it's been government or business or the public sector or the private sector, philanthropy, together we're going to reshape this culture. Not for the world behind us, but give us eyes to see the world ahead of us. Amen.